Hi everyone, this video will introduce you to some of the fundamentals of statistics that are most relevant to carrying out the remainder of our data analysis lessons. First, starting with hypothesis testing. The main components of a hypothesis test are the independent variable, which is the variable that is changing. For example, in our first trout example in the lesson plan, our independent variable in that case is the section or forest section where we are looking at the difference in forest types. In our case, we have clear cut and old growth. Then second, you have your dependent variable. That's the variable you are measuring. In our trout example, our dependent variable is weight because we are interested in how weight varies based on forest types. You then have a target population, which is the complete collection of all sample units of interest within your defined area, time frame, et cetera. But within that target population, you have a sample because it's not often you can measure every single individual in the population. You have a sample of individuals, which is some fraction of that population. And this is what the sample is what you use to estimate some parameter of interest. That parameter is a measure that describes the characteristics of the population. For example, mean or variance are probably most common parameters we work with. And then finally, we have an observed statistic or estimate, and this is a value calculated from the sample in order to estimate the parameter of the population. So when we talk about hypotheses, we often or almost always have our null hypothesis and an alternative, hypo alternative hypothesis for every statistical test we run. Null hypotheses you might often see denoted as H0. This is almost in all cases saying that there is no effect in the population. So here there's no effect of your independent variable on your dependent variable. And then the alternative hypothesis, often denoted as HA, is when there is an effect on the population. An effect is usually the effect of your independent variable on the dependent variable. For example, we're looking at the effect of forest type, clear cut, or old growth on trout weight. And then if your sample provides enough evidence against the null hypothesis, you would then say you reject your null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. So significant tests and p-values. We, we often are always testing hypotheses with statistics. It's Significant testing is the probability of obtaining a test statistic that is at least as extreme as the observed one, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So when we run our statistics to test our hypothesis, this can be our t-test, our ANOVA, our correlation regression, etc. These tests always have a p-value in the result. What these tests are doing is calculating the test statistic, which you don't need to know the math that goes into calculating each of these statistics because R does that on the back end for you. But what we're really focused on is this p-value, which refers to the probability of obtaining your test statistic. That is at least extreme as the observed. Often significant tests are a binary decision based on your p-value, where if p is less than some alpha value, so it's small enough, you reject the null hypothesis. And typically in the scientific realm, we use an alpha value of 0.05. What this means is that there is a 5% chance that your results happened at random. So often this is considered a small enough chance that your results happened by random chance, meaning that there's a 95% chance that our results were not random and there was some significant impact on our independent variable, of our independent variable on our dependent one. So in summary, really the main, the first thing you look at when you get the results of a statistical test is the p-value. If it's small enough, in this case, and in often all cases in this class specifically, less than 0.05, then we would reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, we accept the null hypothesis that there was no effect. So with statistics, often the first question is, what statistical test do I use? And that is dependent on 
your data types of both your predictor or independent variable and your response or dependent variable. I've used this table a lot throughout learning statistics, so hopefully it's useful to use. To you, you might want to copy and paste it somewhere and keep it on hand. So looking at this table, if we have a categorical predictor, predictor or independent variable, we'll use these synonymously, and a categorical and categorical refers to variables that are, are um, qualitative or categories, essentially. And then if we also had a categorical response variable, we would use a chi-square or contingency test. We aren't using this specific test in class, but it's worth knowing these exist if you ever have those type of predictor and response variables in the future. Continuous variables, these are often our numeric variables. They do not have category, categories. They range um, on a continuous numeric scale. If you think about variables like height or weight, these are continuous. If we think back on our penguins data set, things like flipper length, equith, etc., these are continuous variables. But say we have in the case where we have a categorical predictor, which is a variable that is changing, um, for example, in the penguins data set, that would be something like island. Uh, and the variable, the response variable, that that is being affected by the change, if that response variable is continuous, say we we're looking at how flipper length differed by island, um, tests we would use since we have a categorical predictor, island, and a continuous response, flipper length, we would use a t-test. If island only had two groups, or we would use an ANOVA if island had more than two groups. Referring back to one of our lesson plans where we are looking at how um, forest section impacts trout weight, um, our Categorical variable for a section only has two groups, clear cut and old growth. So in that case, we use a t-test. If we are looking at island impact on um, flipper length, since island has three groups, we would use an ANOVA test. In turn, say we had a continuous predictor variable, the thing that is changing, and a categorical response, the statistical test we would use is a logistic regression. We won't be using this in this class. These scenarios are a little less common, but we wanted you to be aware that they exist. Um, a second scenario that we will use often in this class is when we have a continuous predictor variable and a continuous response. The statistical tests we use here are correlation and regression models. With regression, we'll be learning um, with linear regression, we have both simple linear regression and multiple linear regression, where you have one predictor variable versus multiple predictor variables. In that case, testing how a suite of multiple continuous predictor variables are affecting a single continuous response variable. And with each of these statistical tests comes their own unique set of statistical assumptions. Where the inferences we're drawing from the results of statistical tests are reliant on how well the data meet the associated assumptions of that statistical test. Common assumptions we will be working with are normality, linearity, and equal variance, which I'll get into in a second. Just kind of on a general note, the larger the sample size of your data, the more robust statistical tests are to moderate violations of assumptions, which is the case of a lot of these LTER data sampler data sets we're working with. Since they've been, since these projects have been going on since the 80s, they have a lot of data. Therefore, they are a little more robust to violating some of these assumptions, but these type of data sets are really rare. Often you have lower sample sizes 
and you have to be very cautious of meeting these statistical test assumptions. So first looking at normality. We look at the assumption of normality for continuous variables because we can't really get a distribution on categorical variables since they are categories, not numbers. So normal distribution is symmetric at the center, which is often the mean or median of the data. And then the frequency of values follows kind of a bell-shaped distribution equally around the center. So you have your highest frequency at the mean and then lower frequencies taper off, tapering off equally-ish on both sides. So this graph here is showing the orange bell curve fit is the typical shape of a normal distribution, whereas the blue one here is skewed to the right, has multiple um, peaks, and jokingly, the normal distribution is telling the blue one, you're not normal. <laughs> so we can test for the normality assumption graphically. Um, this is where using histograms comes into play. We would use a histogram to look at the distribution of a single continuous variable. And we can visually see if it meets this uh, bell curve shape or if it's skewed, etc. But we can also statistically test for a normal distribution using the test, using a test called the Shapiro Wilk test. The second assumption is linearity. This is relevant to our correlation and regression statistical test, where we have two continuous variables. We have one continuous predictor and a continuous response. Um, and the assumption is that there is a linear or straight line relationship between the independent and dependent variables, as opposed to a quadratic, logistic, etc. shape assuming this relationship is linear. And the third assumption that we commonly will be looking at is the assumption of equal variances. This is referring to the variance within each group. This comes up when we are doing t-tests and ANOVA statistics where we have a categorical predictor instead of a continuous one, um, where the response is um, grouped into two or more um, groups or categories. So with these tests, it assumes that the variance within each category is equal. So you're saying means of the groups can be different, but the variance around that mean should be similar. And where variance refers to how spread the values are around the sample mean. So this image here, while it might be a little blurry, um, this is an example of unequal variances. So say that our data is split into the red and blue, which are our two groups of our predictor variable. Um, the variance around the red group is very small compared to the variance around the mean of the blue group, which is very large and spread out. These are unequal variances. And so if we tested for the equal variance assumption of this data, it would likely return they are not equal and would not fit that assumption. Okay, so then the question is, what do I do if the assumptions aren't met? Um, which very much happens all the time. Step one, the first thing you could do is transform your variables. Um, this is when we have, this is when our variables are continuous and this applies some mathematical operation on the data to change um, each of the values, and two of the most common transformations are log transforming your data, which is shown in this image here. For example, this uh, the image on the left is the raw data. This would not meet the assumption that there is a linear relationship between our continuous predictor and continuous response. If we log transform all of our data points, we now see a linear relationship and that meets the linearity assumption. Or if you don't want to transform your variables or say that didn't um, help fit the assumptions, you can also use 
non-parametric tests on the raw data. So non-parametric test has no assumptions associated with it. Um, and you don't have to transform the data or um, meet any of those assumptions we just talked about. And each parametric statistical test has its essentially its own match non-parametric version. And we can perform all of these in R. Okay, finally, how do we interpret and report our statistical results? So for example, this is specifically showing what the outputs look like in the functions we'll use in R with our R stats package. Um, as we mentioned before, generally the first thing we want to look at is the p-value and then the following associated estimates. For this example, we conducted a p-test to compare trout weight among creeks in the clear-cut and old-growth forests. So after running the t-test function, it will return this screenshot result here. Um, that is essentially a single row data frame um, where each column is an element of the statistical results. So first here, we will look for the p-value, which is the lowercase p variable. When we, just a note, when we do an ANOVA test, you'll notice that there is an AP column and an a, a P adjusted column. Um, in that case, we will look at the adjusted P value because we're doing multiple comparisons. So just a note there, if you ever see a P value and adjusted P value, um, focus on the adjusted P value. So here, our value is 0.06e to the negative 8. Don't get fooled in first looking at just 4.06. Um, this is not a large value. This is actually a very, very small value because we are going to the negative 8th exponent, which you would think move the decimal point 8 numbers to the left. It's 0.0000, I think 7004. So this p-value is very small, much smaller than our 0.05 alpha um, cutoff, which means that there we reject our null hypothesis and there is an effect of forest type on trout weight. So now that we know we have a significant um, statistical test result, we can look at the associated um, values, which in this case we wanted to know does trout weight differ between clear cut and old growth forest. In these results, we have group one is CC, which stands for clear cut. Group two is OG, which stands for old growth. When we look at, so now we wanna know how, which group had higher or lower weights. We can look at the estimate. So estimate one is tied to group one. Estimate two is tied to group two. In this case, we see estimate one the average weight was 1.5, which is higher than the average weight of estimate two, 1.38. So here we would report this result as trout weights in clear cut forests, or more generally, trouts were larger in clear cut forests compared to old growth forests. That is how we would interpret the results of this test with a biological meaning. And another side note is that since we, on the back end, this test was performed on the logged data, which we can see here, we see weight underscore log. So value 1.5 is not the actual weight in grams. This is actually the logged value. Um, so what we could do is go back to the raw weight values and calculate the means. That way to report the proper average weight values something to be aware of when you are transforming the data and looking at the statistical results. So looking at these three main values that are spit out from the t-test function, this is how we would interpret this in proper scientific format in a single sentence. We would say something like cutthroat trout weight was observed to be significantly higher in clear-cut forests compared to old-growth forests, followed by in parentheses the p-value of your statistical test. 
So this is how, when we say proper scientific format, think of how you would report it in a scientific publication. There's many different ways that publications specifically might want you to format this, but often you state the biological meaning of the test and then in parentheses put the p-value of the test. Sometimes journals might like you to put other um, statistical test statistics, um, but here we just want to look at the p-value and make sure it was interpreted correctly.